Good afternoon, everyone. The Chamber's Meet the Candidates Forum will begin with opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes, then we'll move on to a question and answer format. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to each question. The yellow flag will be shown when 15 seconds remain, and the red flag indicates that your time has ended. We will rotate the order in which the questions are answered. If this is not the debate, then questions will not be taken from the audience. We appreciate respectful behavior, and please hold all applause until the end of the forum. Let's start off with our opening statements. Spend two minutes telling us about yourself and what's, and share the skills and abilities you have developed that will make it beneficial as a position as a member of the Purvis Falls City Council and as mayor. We'll start off with our mayoral candidates, Anthony Hicks. Thank you, David, and uh, good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Hicks. Um, I am currently employed as the general manager at the ethanol plant uh, just north uh, west of the city. Um, a position that I've held um, since 2006 and I will uh, retire in fact at the end of this year. So uh, the plant has been obviously a successful business uh, and to the community and turns over quite a lot of um, dollars that also go into our community. I've been on the City Council uh, representing Ward 4 uh, for almost 12 years. Um, I, I believe that it's time uh, to let somebody else and somebody younger to take on that baton. Um, I think you can't stay in a position too long and uh, it's always good to get fresh ideas. Um, I'm running for mayor because I believe that I have the necessary skill set to accomplish the task at hand. Um, I think of it as uh, an anagram called ALFI, and ALFI stands for accountability, leadership, fiscal responsibility, investment in the community, and economic development. And I believe that, you know, as the manager of the plant, I have a significant budget to manage. I have to hold people accountable for what they do. Um, I have to lead um, to get things done every day because I'm only one person and the plant takes a team of 44 of us to operate. And I understand economic development. I was engaged in the plant and the plant is still probably the single largest uh, private um, investment that's happened in Fix Falls with uh, over $133 million. I've served on multiple committees during my time on the council as well as uh, just in the, in the general public. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Scott Quaggy. Thank you, Dave. Thank you all for being here today. I'm currently on the council board, too. I've been elected twice there. And the best way to know uh, what I'm all about is to check me out on Facebook. It's Scott Kwame for mayor. I'm going to get right down to business. What's best for our city? Who is best to serve our city as mayor? We need a manager. We need someone who can handle the business aspects of the job, someone who can handle efficient meetings and take care of business that way. But we also need a salesman. We need a promoter. We need someone who can put together the people and the resources to get things done. I'm a former small business owner and a manager and uh, many, many years as a salesman. I'm well prepared for this mayor's position for such a time as this. With Mr. Hicks, you'll get half of the package. But with me, you'll get the whole bundle. Someone who loves Fergus Falls, loves to tell what a great place this is to live, work, and raise a family. I think it's important that you would know how I see the world, or how anybody would see the world, but in my case, how do I make decisions? How do I lead things? I'm a Christian man, and my desire is to see the world through that biblical perspective and to seek objective truth. My sense is that Mr. Hicks' approach is more of a secular worldview, and that's very important to some folks, and I wanted to make that clear. My desire, my goal for Fergus Falls is to grow this as a family-friendly and business-friendly city. Consider the recent mandate from the state that legalized recreational marijuana. Fergus Falls is going to have to permit at least one recreational marijuana shop in, in town. Remember, this product is still illegal on the federal level. and It's considered a gateway drug, and half the country still is not uh, on board with any sort of legalization. My view is that this state mandate can be, re can be fulfilled but with restrictions by putting it in a retail zone, not downtown where we've got the Dance Academy and the Children's Museum and the Gymnastics School. This isn't an argument about access, but about image and normalization 
of a recreational product. Let's move to Ward 3, Nate Cuppy. Good afternoon. I uh, just want to take a moment to thank the Chamber for putting on this event. Uh, anything that seems like Lisa and Gia and uh, Missy and the staff do at the Chamber is always done very professionally, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, myself and my family, we moved here in 2018. I'm an operations manager for Ottertail Power Company. With that background, I focus a lot on what we call operational excellence. So that's basically taking a look at your processes and figuring out a way, how do we make them more efficient, more um, profitable, how do we make them safe? So a lot of my background is a lot about uh, infrastructure replacements and working on system reliability. Uh, manage a lot of multi-million dollar projects over several years. I uh, worked through a lot of permitting issues with that, dealing with whether it's state permit, county permit, even down to the township level at times. Um, some of the other things that have uh, been involved in the community, I'm currently the incoming board chairman on the Chamber of Commerce. So um, throughout the last uh, few years, I've actually had a you know, an ears approach to what our business community needs, how they feel, what the business climate is like in this community. Um, along with that, I currently serve on the Planning Commission as well. Been on there for the past few years. Uh, some of the work that we've done there is to uh, roll back some of the restrictions and um, respect the personal property or property owner rights. Um, and we continue to do that. Even last night, we, we stumbled across some old ordinance code that we just thought wasn't applicable anymore. So uh, we kind of roll up our hands and start digging into some of that as well. So you know, some of the reasons why I, I want to run here for city council is when we moved here, um, it just right away really had a hometown feel for us. My wife and I both grew up in small towns in the Dakotas. And we just really felt at home. Um, I feel just as like we do with our military members, how they give back to the community. This is my opportunity to give back. Thank you, Nate. Mike Mortensen. Uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate it very, very much. I want to thank you and Leighton Broadcasting, Peg Access, and definitely the Chamber for their uh, effort today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. In fact, it's an honor to be here that I'm able to come in front of uh, radio, TV, and all the members of the community here to be able to speak. This is not something that everybody gets to do every day, and uh, I don't take this honor lightly here today. I want to thank Nate Kunde. Um, Nate and I uh, ran for the council in kind of the vacant seat here a few months ago, and I tell you what, I've got a lot of respect for Nate. I really do. It, it took a lot of guts for us to go up in front of the council together and do that. So I thank him for running. I think whoever's in the third board, whether it's Nate or myself, I think the city would be represented very, very well on that end. A little bit about me, um, I love this city. You know, my grandfather loved this city in 1870 when he came, and we've never left and I'll never leave. I've invested great amounts of money in business here. Uh, I grew up here, went to school here. This is where I live. And I think it's a time in my life now, in my early 50s, to give back to that, give back to where I live, give some of my experiences of what I've done in life to, to do that. I'm a doctor of chiropractic at the VA hospital in Fargo, North Dakota, and I serve our nation's veterans there every single day. And it's the greatest honor of my life to do that. Uh, I served in the United States Marine Corps, uh, served in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1992 and 93. So my connection with those veterans is immense. Uh, on top of that, I was provider of the year uh, up at the hospital in 2020. I'm an adjunct faculty professor for two chiropractic universities. I am a clinical instructor for the UND School of Medicine. Um, I'm doing my master's in public health through UND. Uh, and then I own a billboard company here in town. And I tell you, that tall billboard you see by Thrifty White, it was tough. It was tough. To get. <laughs> and so uh, uh, on top of that, my passion is for veterans, but my second passion is in that billboard company to help our, our businesses in this community because if we can make them thrive, we'll thrive, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Let's move to Ward 4, Laurel Kilby. Thanks, Dave and the Chamber. My name is Laurel Kilby. I was born and raised in Fergus Falls, and I attended the Fergus Falls Public Schools and graduated from M State. I've been married to my husband, Ryan, who's also a Fergus Falls native for 23 years, and we continue to reside in Fergus Falls. My husband and I built a seasonal retail business in Detroit Lake six years ago, and we most recently expanded and opened an additional
Uh, most recently opened an additional 3,600 square foot year-round location in Otter Tail this past summer. I'm an office manager of a small law firm in Fergus Falls. For many years, I operated a private in-home childcare business. I've also worked with residential construction management, and I've been licensed as a real estate salesperson in the state of Minnesota since 2006. My background as a retail business owner brings a new perspective to the council and will be an asset to our retail community in Fergus Falls. Some of my most recent community involvement includes serving on the Planning Commission since 2018. I have chaired that group since 2022. This perspective on the inner workings and the ordinance structure and zoning in Fergus Falls that we have in place right now will serve the community well as I am a member of the council. I have worked with others to lead positive changes to these ordinances to allow homeowners to make logical improvements to their properties with more freedom for property owners with less red tape from the city. As a council, we must take bold steps to make it easier to do business in our community. I have heard from many throughout the city that at times it can be harder to start or thrive as a business here compared to other communities. We must not overburden our businesses or property owners with excessive rules and regulations and change that narrative once and for all with action to modernize our code. My planning commission experience positions me well with those changes. I've also served on the Housing Task Force Committee for the City of Fergus Falls, the RTC Reuse Master Plan Group, and I am past president of the Otters Hill County Children's Services Association that is a United Way supported nonprofit. Thank you, Laurel. <clears throat> okay, we'll time for the questions. You will each have 90 seconds, that's a minute and a half, to answer each question. We'll rotate the order in which the questions are answered. Question one, in your opinion, what is a primary barrier preventing the city of Fergus Falls from achieving its full potential? We'll start off with our mayoral candidates, Anthony Hayes. In your opinion, what is the primary barrier preventing the city of Fergus Falls from achieving its full potential? The obviously the you know asking the primary um, barrier to achieving full potential for the city. I, I think it's actually collaboration. Um, I, I think you know we don't. Um, we have a lot of people that are very, very supportive of Fergus Falls, but I think we don't bring everybody together and actually work um, in, in unison. And so we've got different groups that are working on different projects uh, around the city. And sometimes, you know, things don't get done because of, of that barrier of bringing everybody together. So I think the first thing we need to do is actually <laughs> Create a forum where people can actually talk, and uh, not not in a hostile environment where they can have an opinion about where they want to see the city. I think we we do need to increase tax base. Um, I think as uh, you know, we we also do need to review all of our regulations and ordinances. The city is very quick to create ordinance when something happens, and then it just sits on the books and then we don't enforce those ordinance after that. So I think overall, we just need to start talking together and have a, a one, one vision of where we want to go as a city. Thank you, Anthony. Scott Plunkett. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Anthony makes some good points as far as how we communicate, and how we pull together, and how everybody is on the same page, and how there's examples that you can find throughout the city where People are kind of doing their own thing and not talking to everybody in complimentary ways like you might expect. I think a good example, frankly, right now is the new school referendum that's on the ballot also coming up out in November. Um, the, there's some folks that are pretty upset about it that uh, think it shouldn't happen and they don't feel like they've been consulted, they don't feel like they've been represented. And I'm not here to speak for or against it, I'm just talking about the process. There's some folks that I hear from that are so concerned about the process that it doesn't really matter what the proposal is. And I think it's an illustration of how we can have a group, whether it's the school or the county or the city or some other group, uh, that can be kind of in their own lane. And I think that we can work together better and improve on that. Um, some of the other things that we could take a look at, as far as that goes, is how to improve things for housing and childcare. 
how to improve things just generally for economic development. Places that the city can have an improvement or have a, an, an impact on improving things to achieve this full potential that you, you're asking about. And there's, a, there's ways to do that. And so work for the greater good and collaborate. Those are all good things. And that's what I would hope to bring to the mayor's seat. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Moving to War 3, Nate Cundy. So similar to what the mayoral candidates had mentioned, I think uh, collaboration and working toward a common vision needs to be a common thread across all of our boards and commissions in our community. Um, I think one of the things that is lacking right now is a chance to bring representatives from each one of those boards together on a frequent basis to make sure that we're all working toward a common vision and common thread. Uh, that's something that I would be hope to uh, start as a hopefully successful city council candidate. But on the like the economic development side of things, I think one of the biggest concerns that most of our industry and our businesses have is a workforce shortage. Um, you pair that with a housing inventory shortage that we have in our community, and that ends up being probably the biggest economic driver or pitfall that we have. So it's kind of the old saying, if you build it, they will come, right? So we have a lot of industry that's primed and ripe for ready for expansion, but they currently have shifts that go unfilled because they can't find uh, the candidates to come and work there. So one of the big um, initiatives that I would push for would be to develop more housing within our community and grow our workforce. Thank you, Nate. Mike Watson. Well, I tell you what, barrier uh, is an unusual word that's used, Dave. And uh, you know, does that mean that we're restricting something? Does that mean we're having to overcome an obstacle? To some people in our community, there's been no barriers. Uh, there's been a great amount of uh, success down along the river. <clears throat> Uh, the river walk, the splash pad, we're having the, the other stuff uh, done down there. And I think uh, to that uh, part of the segment of the city, there's been great success down in that region. If you look at the barrier to what one of the main things that's happening in our city is we don't have the funds that we need. Every time I look at something on the city council, I'll look at it as a businessman and someone that lives here. And one of the things that you absolutely have to do to succeed in the city is have revenue. If you don't have the revenue in a business, your business will fail. If you don't have revenue in your business, you will not buy new trucks, you will not buy new cranes, you will not hire new employees, you won't do any of that. And it's really not that much different in a city. If you don't have the tax base and the revenue to do all the things that we need to do in this community, we'll say we have barriers. What I want to do is I want to help is be one of the eight on this council to bring them business experience that shows that we will generate revenue in this city. We won't just raise taxes, we'll bring business in, we'll bring industry in, we'll bring more retail in, we'll bring housing in, and what we'll do is we'll get the economic engines of this city rolling so we don't have barriers. I wanna be able to add to that river walk down there. I wanna be able to add to things when that big uh, flour mill gets done. I don't wanna hinder it, I wanna add to it, but I wanna add to it with revenue, not just tax base on the people. Thank you, Mike. Moving to Ward 4, Laurel Kilby. We're going to get a mic that works. Sorry. Um, I agree with pretty much everything everyone has said here, so not to sound like a broken record. As a city government, I think we need to really focus on listening. We spend a lot of time, I feel, doing what we think everyone wants, and I feel like it needs to be a two way street of communication where we're listening to our business owners and to our residents and finding out what they really need. And I think there needs to be more, di more dialogue and more intentional listening to everyone in the community. As a city as a whole, I agree we have a shortage of workers. We have a shortage of housing, workforce housing. We probably also have a shortage in senior housing that's affordable for our seniors to be able to move out of their homes and into a good, safe place to live that they can afford. And if we can free up some seniors out of their homes into a good place to live, we'll open up more workforce housing. Not everybody wants to live in an apartment building and we need to free up some of our housing stock too, but those seniors need a place to live that they can afford. Thank you, Laurel. Our next question, do you support the use of economic development incentives like tax increment financing, tax abatement, and economic development loans to attract and retain businesses in Fergus Falls? Well, please explain your reasoning. We'll start in Ward 3 this time with Mike Mortensen. 
Dave, what a loaded question, huh? Uh, what a loaded question. So from a business standpoint, I want every business to succeed in this community. I don't care what it is. Uh, we have to succeed. Tax instrument financing, in my opinion, you need to be able to bring something to the table where you're going to bring uh, either increased workforce uh, for us or you're going to bring a tax base to us. Because in, in the business world, and, I'll, and I think as far as with the city, if you bring us something, we'll bring something for you. And I think if you can't bring that to the table, I think then it should be a question whether we use some of those incentives for certain businesses. When I look at it, I, I say a business should have at least 50 employees that they're going to bring to the table for tax increment financing, and they need to substantially add to that tax base. Uh, we know very well that the bank was in question here this last year with tax instrument financing, and uh, I think it was tough on our community to see that, hear that, and talk about that. So. Um, it can be used, but it better be used to better our city and uh, to grow our city, and that's uh, that's the way I would view it. Thank you, Mike. Dave Cuddy. So my short answer is yes. I, I believe in a all options approach to economic development, and the reason why is because we're competing beyond just our city limits beyond just our county, beyond just our state. You can drive up to Fargo and have the opportunity to have Renaissance zones, which is basically um, you know, a, a TIF district on steroids that's already basically pre-planned, right? And business can go in there, regentrify a neighborhood, and do that with uh, low impact of property taxes for an incremental amount of time. So when you drive up to the FM area and you cross the river and you see why is Fargo so much more developed than Moorhead is? I mean, that's a, that's a key difference right there. That's a key driver. So to be competitive, we have to put every tool in our toolbox to work, um, not just one or the other or pick winners and losers. We need to be able to say, whoever, wherever, whatever, come here. We're open for business. We're here to help you. Thank you, Nate. Let's move to Ward 4, Laurel Kildee. Absolutely, I support those uses uh, within our community to aid economic development. We need to increase our tax base in a way that actually makes a difference for our taxpayers so we can take care of our infrastructure and our roads and we can do the things that enhance community for our families and everyone that lives here without burdening our taxpayers too much. So bottom line, we need to do what we can to increase our tax base. That might include TIP, it can also be new market tax credits. There are historical tax credits available. There are a lot of state and federal grants for specific projects. I feel like we need to, as a council and as city staff, work together to identify all funding sources so we can accomplish the things for everyone without burdening our taxpayers. Moving to our mayoral candidates, Scott Plumbing. Thank you, Dave. Well, of course, we support economic development in every way that we can get. And this is an area that, as has been suggested here, has been a little touchy on certain projects. And there are folks that believe that any use of tax abatement or tax increment financing, for example, shouldn't be done as though it's some sort of giveaway. And so I'd like to take an opportunity to just try and explain it a little bit, because I think it's helpful to hear it because it takes a while to absorb and understand just how these things work. If, if there's a business that wants to open up or build something and they're not currently there, we're receiving no taxes from that property. But going through the process of getting an abatement or getting a, an increment financing program, the thing gets built, our tax revenue goes up, the amount of taxes that are increased over what it had been to now what it is, that's what gets captured, that's what pays the loans back. We're not out money, out of pocket. It's money that comes as the project is finished and developed. And yet it is often portrayed as some sort of giveaway. And it's, it's not an out of pocket expense, it's an incentive. And it has a proper place in time. There are some projects that don't qualify naturally. But for companies and operations that you know, know how the process works and are willing to go through it, we need to work with them. And I think it's an effective way to see some things grow and see some things done. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Anthony Hicks. 
I think equally I would say yes and obviously agree with many of the comments that have already been spoken. But I think you know the caveat that I would add is that you do have to look at specific projects um, and, and for, for a good reason. Um, as somebody alluded to, you know, the Shopco uh, site, uh, obviously that was a, a business that basically at the time um, was showing a $7 million profit um, in the year and the city gave them $327,000 of uh, TIF to, to enable uh, the demolition of that building. And I think, you know, you have to kind of look at it that we have never given any incentive as a city to any other bank in town. And I, I am happy to report that I, I did not vote for that and my candidate um, comp competitor here did. And I think it's important to know why why we're doing it. And we sh all businesses obviously are for profit, but when you make $7 million in eight months and then you ask the residents for that money, I think that's unfair on the citizens of Fergus Falls. And at the same time, they said that if we, you know, if we didn't give that money, they would stop their charitable giving. And I think that is also, you know, uh, not a nice thing to do. So I think, you know, overall, you, you look at the Stanford Avenue project. If that goes through, we will have a lot of money from the state to help support that. Thank you, Anthony. Moving on to our third question. Would you support or oppose a third proposal to implement franchise fees to fund road construction projects in Fergus Falls? And please explain your reasoning. We'll start at Ward 4, Laurel Kilby. We're going to go back to this mic. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. Um, franchise fees. Um, I think the first thing we need to do before we talk about franchise fees again is look at the accelerated plan that the current council has in place that increased the spending on our roads by 20%. And we need to update that list with roads that maybe have deteriorated more since that list was created and those project plans were created. And then we need to look at what that what will be accomplished on that schedule versus what adding franchise fees would accomplish because I've personally never seen that list. I don't know if adding a franchise tax to everyone paying utilities in town would do one more road a year or four more roads a year. I don't know what that impact is. And I think we need to answer that for our citizens. My gut reaction is no, it would not be something I would support. Um, as president of our church council right now, that would add fees to all of our nonprofits that don't pay property taxes right now. And I know how hard all nonprofits are working to survive in a post COVID world. And we need to support our nonprofits and support our renters, many of which have told me that they've had rent double in the last four years. And this would be added on to their utility bills too, not just our property owners. So I think we need to look at a plan outside of upping those fees for people that really can't afford it. Thank you, Laurel. We'll move on to our mayoral candidates at the end. Um, thank you. I, I think ultimately the, the, the simple answer is no, um, but I think part of that is because you know there are additional state uh, dollars that are available, and I think we, we don't work um, well enough with the county um, accessing a lot of those funds, um, and I think that that's one of the things that you know I wish to do as as mayor is um, build a relationship. We the city does not have a relationship with the county today and uh, we don't access them and we don't get a lot from the county. So I think we need to build that relationship, use them as the conduit to get state funding for some of our roads. We have state aid and um, you know, to go to roads and we did spend $750,000 of that state aid on, on the roundabout at Fur. Um, we were able to then actually get a grant that obviously brought that dollars back but that money would have probably been better spent on Cleveland, you know, that would have benefited from that road, that road work. You know, we also spend money, and I think that's where we have to start to prioritize where we spend the money. We spent $1.1 million on the, the blocks outside Union Pizza to Wells Fargo Bank. 
Um, I did not vote for that. That's for two blocks, $1.1 million. That would have done a mile of road and somewhere else in town from a reconstruction point of view. So I think we, we have to look where we spend our dollars. Thank you, Anthony. Scott Plumbing. Okay. The, the idea of a franchise fee or whatever uh, that would come up, yes, about would we support it. First of all, the, the mayor doesn't get a vote. The way that our structure is set up, this is going to be a decision that will be made by the council. So to the degree that I can support or not, I would be able to advocate, in my view, hopefully for all the residents of the city. That would be, as I see the mayor's position, advocating for all of the city and to bring their voices to the table and to make sure that everybody is heard. So then beyond that, I think it's important to understand what franchise fees are. I think it's been talked about. Uh, people see it as a tax, and it's an increased cost, and that's true. It would go through your utility bills. It would be on your electric bill, your gas bill, and the money would be designated for street work. So it comes back to what do you want? If you want good streets and you want them, and when do you want them, well, this may be a way to get them sooner and may be a way to catch up on the maintenance that's been delayed. If we don't continue to improve and maintain what we've got and fall further and further behind, at some point there's going to have to be a real big jump in property taxes. So my view is that I lean towards supporting them if they're understood and that they're implemented well. And yet it needs to be represented from the whole city. And if they're ready for it, and maybe now is not the time, but maybe that time will come once we understand it and are better prepared to absorb it and I'll go forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Let's move to Ward 3, Dave Cundy. So I think some of the comments here have highlighted a, a common need, and that's one of the things on running on the platform is developing a comprehensive infrastructure replacement plan, something beyond five years. We, Anthony just kind of alluded to, well, we spent $1.1 million on two blocks. To me, that says, that's bad planning. Why would we not have a long range plan that shows where we're gonna spend our money, what we need to budget for that, and then where are we short on the funds that we already have? I think another thing that was set up here is we need to take a look at where the spending is happening. Well, this plan would do that, but one of the things that I wanna do is be able to put that plan in place, put it on an interactive map called a GIS system, and basically get it to the point where you can click on the asset, see the age of it, see what was spent, where the funding came from, and then develop a plan on top of that so you can actually see when it's going to get fixed, when it's going to get replaced, the associated or estimated cost with that, and develop that long range. I'm talking greater than just a rolling five-year plan. But as far as the franchise fee goes, the only benefit I see of really implementing that is it spreads the cost or the burden across multiple ratepayers in the community rather than just the property taxes. The only way I would support that is if it is paired with a property tax reduction to basically be a net zero cost impact to the community. Thank you, Nate. Mike Mortensen. Well, first off, I'm not a politician. Second off, I'm a Marine, and so integrity and character means everything to me, so the answer is no. The residents of the city have spoke pretty loudly and they've talked about it. They do not want a franchise fee. They do not want another tax put on them. And one of the things as a representative of the third ward is to go around and listen to those people when they talk that way. There's many elderly, there's many young, young couples that are just starting out that are probably not in the position that we are sitting here today. Many of us in this room could afford a franchise tax 10 times over but that doesn't mean everybody in our community can afford that franchise tax 10 times over. I would say no, I'm not a politician. It should not be done. We can find other ways to generate more revenue in this city and that's where the bigger problem is, is if we don't generate business in this city and generate the tax base that we need to generate money like a revenue of a business, then we're in a much bigger problem than one franchise fee in this community in my opinion. Thank you, Mike. On to our fourth question. How do you plan to resolve conflicts and maintain a productive relationships with city staff and other city council members, even in the face of differing opinions or when decisions don't go in your favor? We'll start with our mayoral candidates, Scott Kwame. Well, that's something that can 
be applied no matter what you're in, whether you're in the business of city work or business work or school or whatever it would be. How do you resolve conflict? Well, obviously the first steps are to get the people together that aren't agreeing and talk to them and, and find out where the problem is, try and identify the problem and sort it out. I don't know that this is a question that even takes 90 seconds to answer to. Um, you talk to people and you work it out. And you, if you've got uh, to go beyond that to find help for people that need uh, some resolution, some aspect of their issue that can be addressed, whether it's a city staff office, whether it's uh, beyond that. Uh, identify the problem, find the help for it, and take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Anthony Hicks. I think, um, you know, not that I deal with uh, conflict every day, but obviously I do deal with employees every day. And, you know, sometimes obviously everybody doesn't see eye to eye and you have to, you have to basically face it head on. The, the longer you leave something um, like that unaddressed, um, it only gets worse. And uh, I think, you know, you also have to establish what the rules are and you also have to enforce the rules. Um, the city does have a code of conduct um, and ethics, but uh, quite frankly, we don't really have a process by which we actually do anything about it. We created the policy and there's no mechanism to follow through. And I think that's the one thing that we need to do uh, so that everybody knows what the repercussions are um, as, as you go down that path. And as Scott said, basically you have to you have to talk to people. Um, you know, ultimately I am a, you know, th that is my job. Sometimes I describe my job or plan as basically being a glorified babysitter uh, because I have to make people do things that I want them to do um, and get make them to do it in a, in a willing fashion so they want to do it and they want to succeed. And I think you have to give people that opportunity. And if you lead them as opposed to suppressing them then they will follow you. Thank you, Anthony. Moving to Ward 3, Mike Mortensen. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, again, I'm going to come at this uh, not as a council member, not as somebody that's been in the city. I'm going to come at this as a doctor and give you a little explanation of how I have to get along with other providers, how I have to get along for the good of the patient that's sitting in front of us. Um, I had spoke at the council a number of months ago that I'm on a multidisciplinary pain team where you take 10 different doctors and you put them in a room with one patient for two hours. And we look at that veteran and we look at all the needs that he has, whether he's missing a leg, missing an arm, whether he's got spinal issues uh, from body armor or whatever it is. And you've got 10 of the biggest egos with those doctors in that room when you're in there. And what you have to do is you have to say first, I'm going to do no harm for this patient. So as a council member, i got to say first that i got to do no harm for my district, the third ward, to get along with people. And then what you need to do is you need to have leadership. It all comes back to leadership. The ability to influence people to do what is right for the person or the constituents that are sitting in front of you. So everything I do when I'm in that room, when we have 10 different doctors and we're coming at this from many different ways, we know we're going to compromise for what's the good of that veteran. I know when I'm talking with the other uh, council members, the mayor, or the city administration, I'm going to do everything I can for the constituents of my board to do no harm for that district. Thank you, Mike. Nate Cundy. So I work with differing opinions and conflict in so many different areas on pretty much every day of my job, whether that's from property owners, whether that's from union labor staff, whether that's from internal engineering, sourcing, uh, HR issues, on down the line. Um, some of the other aspects of my experience have been on the, like the planning commission, there's differing opinions there. On the chamber of commerce and that board, there's differing opinions and different approaches that members want to take. And one of the things and common threads that I found to be very successful in this is you need to listen and understand the perspective that they're coming from because that's widely different than maybe the perspective of your own and your background and your experiences. 
So I think if you take a, an opportunity to listen to, to them, understand where they're coming from, but then also genuinely explain your thoughts and processes and your perspectives there, then it's okay to, to agree to disagree. But finding a common ground forward is really the ultimate goal. And that's something that I've had a long history of being able to do, whether it's professionally or whether that's through volunteer opportunities. Thank you, Nate. Let's move to Ward 4, Laurel Kildee. Um, I think differing opinions are vital to making good decisions on behalf of our community. I think we have to listen to everybody and listen to all perspectives. And if we do so with the cornerstones of truth and compassion and respect in that process, I think it naturally leads to transparency as a council to our community, accountability to our citizens, and will be build trust with relationships if it's staff or members of the public or other council members. And I think we need to be willing to compromise. I think it's in the best interest of our city to get things done. And to do so, we need to not be bogged down in little things or whose idea it was. We need to find a way to compromise and accomplish things for the city of Frick's Falls. Thank you, Laurel. We're gonna wrap up today's Q&A with questions specifically for our mayoral candidates. As members of the City Council, each of you were part of creating the City's 2023 to 2027 strategic plan. Has there been enough work done on that plan, and which project or goal do you think is most critical now? We'll start with Anthony X. Well, it's fun to go first on these ones. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm adverse to plans. Um, the city spends a lot of money on plans overall, and I think you know one of the reasons for that is that we don't actually do a lot with the plans. Um, we create them, and then they tend to sit on the shelf. And you know, if you go back into you know when Gordon Hajdukovic was in you know in you know in City Hall, you know he had similar plans. They just weren't probably as fancy, but he had boards, and many of the things that were on those boards are very much the same as the ones that we have now. Um, you know, with that said, obviously we do have a plan. Um, you know, all of those plans have been enacted. Um, ultimately, obviously, you know, Riverfront Park and uh, you know the Splash Pad were, were all designated in there. That switched, obviously, from an amphitheater. Um, you know, the city has purchased the dairy property and is actively seeking people, obviously, to you know, build on that in terms of housing, you know, which obviously would help that corridor. You know, the Stanton Avenue project is, is another one that's been done. So, you know, a lot of those things have been done. You know, all of those things, you know, will they get done? You know, it's, um, as, as earlier mentioned, it's all about funding on getting some of those things to a reality. But I think overall, as I say, I'm adverse to more plans. Thank you, Anthony. Scott Plumbing. Thank you, Dave. The thing that brought me to the council in the first place years ago was the RTC, the Regional Treatment Center, and the opportunity that I see there. I think that that is a potential economic boom for the city. I think that we've got opportunity there that uh, we just haven't tapped. And so as far as the strategic plan goes, as at this point, there isn't anybody even talking about it. There isn't even a committee in the works uh, you know, pursuing any opportunities there. And as mayor, one of my first actions would be to get a committee started, to get a group together, to at least begin talking about, okay, how are we going to move forward with this? Because a plan exists. The master plan was bought and paid for three years ago, and it's sitting on the shelf. And the will has not been there for the current council to take it off the shelf and go to work and try and find developers to put that plan into place. Um, it won't cost us anything to put a group together and start talking about it, trying to find resources, trying to find uh, places and people that are interested in, in going on board. There's volunteers that are just itching to be involved, and we can, we can get the ball rolling on something up there. I've worked with the State Historical Preservation Office, uh, Michael Coop down there at Chippo, and with others, and I think that we've got a terrific opportunity just waiting for us there. Uh, beyond that, we've got all these other plans. Most of them people see as road projects or other things. And uh, we just got to find the money and go after the money, and that'll make these plans come together. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. 
There's been a lot of progress been made over the past decade to revitalize downtown, more recently to inspire economic development. What incentives would you put forth to keep this momentum going? And how would you work with city staff, outside organizations, and the council to keep things moving forward? We'll start with Scott. Scott's plug. Well, the incentives that exist, that you mentioned before, tax and rent financing and tax abatement, things like that. You know, there's other programs that are in place that you can provide to businesses. And of course, the people that are involved in economic development, and for those of us who have to go out and tell the story, well, we can tell that story. We can provide those kinds of things. But I think it's more about establishing a tone and setting a positive view of the city, saying this is a great place to live. If you had your business here, you would do well. You would have great employees. Your kids would have great schools. You would have great places to bring your kids to the Splash Pad or the Daily Moon Park or to the other many places that we've got. There's all sorts of recreational activities. We've got great churches. We've got a great quality of life here in Fergus Falls. And I think the best incentive that I can offer someone interested in looking at placing a business or expanding a business here is just to point out all the good things that we've got to offer that make living here in Fergus Falls a great place. And Beyond that, if they want to talk about tax increment financing or something, okay, we'll talk about that too. But in many ways, that's a bonus because you get to live here, and I think this is a great place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Anthony Hicks. I, I think um, a lot of good has been already done, obviously, downtown. Um, I think I, I sit as a chair on business development for Perks Falls, and, and we make uh, loans to local businesses, many of which are actually being downtown, um, whether it's for you know, renovation of the building or whether it's for, for the facades. Um, but you know, and I think you know, the, the big piece that's probably happening now is, is obviously the old mill. Um, I always thought that you know, that was one of the biggest eyesores in Fergus. And you know, when you come downtown, and that's the first thing people see. And I think you know that renovation will obviously also change. You know the fact we have a hotel downtown. I think we also have to remove barriers. Um, Stella's recently obviously um, opened downtown, um, but that was delayed because of your know, regulations that are in place that were a lot stricter and tougher than in Battle Lake where they're already at. And I think you know if we want to encourage more businesses downtown, we have to. We have to do that. Um, you know, the downtown road from council was a, a, a group that was very, you know, dedicated to enhancing, you know, things happening in that community, and that's actually in danger of disbanding because of trying to get people interested in joining that group and helping promote downtown. And I think that's another thing that we have to revitalize. Thank you, Anthony. Let's we'll wrap up the forum with closing statements. Each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks, in which they may include additional information about question topics and the reasons people should support them. Closing statements are in reverse order, so we'll start with Laurel Gilby and Ward Four. This is my hometown. I want it to be the best that it can be, and I believe that my business background, my varied life experiences, my problem-solving mindset, together with my reasonably minded appro approach to governance, administration, and operations can be of service on the next council. I find myself in a humbling and unique position as I am unopposed on the fourth ward ballot. I want the people of our ward to know that I am committed to working just as hard towards earning your vote by listening to your experiences, needs, and ideas. I truly seek to still be the chosen candidate because of these relationships, along with my commitment to leading with respect, common sense, and approachability. I plan to continue to meet you on your front steps and in your businesses to hear about how the City of Fergus Falls can be a better partner in your endeavors and how we can support our citizens and meet your needs and expectations as a city government. I recognize we have a lot of hard work ahead of us. We must improve our infrastructure and roads be partners in meaningful economic development to grow our tax base by facilitating conversations and actions around intentional business recruitment, quality market rate housing support, and daycare shortages. We must support private development, seek grant monies, and make responsible decisions 
to accomplish these goals in ways that do not outspend our citizens' ability to pay. I am a person who will listen to differing points of view, actively seek creative solutions and partnerships, value feedback from all, and believe quality paths of action can be defined by doing so. I want Fergus Falls to be safe, to be affordable, to be well kept, to be an environment where business ventures are encouraged and can thrive. Our community has so many unique assets. It's people, it's arts, it's architecture, it's education, it's businesses, healthcare, and our amenities. I want to work with others to highlight them, build upon them, and lay the foundation for an ever better future of Fergus Falls. Thank you, Laurel. Let's move to Ward 3, Mike Hortson. Again, I want to thank the Chamber for uh, holding the event today, and, and again, what an honor it is to be here in front of you. Um, I love this city. I've always loved this city. Um, I've done business in this city now for almost 20 years. I uh, went to high school here, grew up here, grandparents are here, parents are here. This city means everything to me. I work up at the Veterans Hospital, but I make that choice to drive every single day to serve our nation's heroes because I want to live here. I don't want to live there. I don't want to have Fergus be like Fargo. So one of the things that uh, is very important to me is that um, the businesses in this community have devoted my time, my life, to helping them grow. Every single time you see one of my digital billboards flip, every single time you drive by one of my billboards, I'm here to support our community. It's not just about making money for me. It's about our community growing and prospering and being that way. I'm a veteran military leader, and I'll bring that experience to the council, and I've led people in some of the most difficult situations on the face of the earth. I'm an institutional leader. I'm on boards of many universities, and I also teach through UND. And I say those things to you today, not because I want to be grandiose or brag about them. I want you to realize that other people outside of this community and other areas have trusted me, trusted me to lead them, trusted me to teach them, trusted me to be part of their life. When I was in Mogadishu, Somalia, and, and many had heard this when I, uh, when I spoke in front of the council, I was there in 1993, and uh, a group of us came in off a of patrol, and we came into what was called the safe zone uh, in the old U.S. Embassy grounds. As we came in there, the sniper fire started to rain down on us. And as we hit the ground and we laid there, as we sucked the dirt that went into our lungs, all I could think about was two things. One, was the Marines that were with me, were they safe? And two, I wanted to come home. I wanted to come home to Fergus Falls. And that was it. Thank you, Mike. Okay, come here. Well, thank you, Mike, for your service to our country, first of all, and thank you to all the candidates for um, committing to coming to this event and making it successful for the Chamber and the community. At its core, the city is essentially a utility company. That's my professional background. I know the ins and outs of running a utility company, the day-to-day -day operations. You hear a lot of talk about uh, saving money, ways that we can look at expenses, get somebody that can go under the hood of the utility company and actually know what they're looking at. Somebody that's gonna come with innovative ways to be able to put cost-saving measures in the future and actually take a look and develop long-range plans to be able to invest wisely into our infrastructure. Aside from that, I think Fergus Falls needs to take a look at growing up versus necessarily always focused on growing out. One of the ways that we can increase profitability in our city without increasing the need for infrastructure is by quite literally growing up. That means apartment buildings, high-rises, things of that nature. But we need to foster an environment that attracts private equity into our community. You take a look at neighboring communities in Ottertail County, such as Perham, that have groups like Grow Perham. They were successful in implementing a five-story mixed-use building right downtown. You want downtown to be more, success or more um, successful? Get people down there. That's the answer. One of the surefire ways to make it more attractive is get people living down there. So the more development that we, that we can do and the more that we can promote that, the better livelihood we'll have in our community and the less that we'll have to invest into future infrastructure. The city actually owns a parcel of land known as the Norgren property, north of town, 
I don't know how many years they've owned it, it's before my time, but it's so expensive to get infrastructure out there, it kind of makes you wonder why did we purchase it in the first place without having a plan to get the infrastructure out there. I yield my time. Thank you, Nate. Let's move over to our mayoral candidates, <coughs> Scott Plunkett. Thank you. The way I want to present this is, what's best for the city of Fergus Falls? That's the question I ask myself, whatever the question might be. I want to be your advocate for a family-friendly, business-friendly city. Consider, for example, the Riverfront Pavilion Splash Map. We've heard a lot about that, and it's an excellent amenity. It's bringing life and further development to our downtown in what was a blighted area. The overall cost of the project was a little over 10 million, 10 and a half. Five million from the state, couple million from private donors, generous private donors, and three million from the city. This $3 million investment was a good deal for families, it was good for business, it's been good for our city, and we have a $10 million asset that we got for $3 million. It's a good deal. So it's time for a fact check. We've heard from Mark Layton often, and last night I heard from him again. He repeatedly includes this downtown project in his claims that the city has wasted money on wants instead of needs. I believe we need amenities like this to attract and retain young families and new businesses. But it's time to push back on Mark Layton and how he routinely manipulates the numbers to fit his agenda, often presenting misleading and incomplete statements that create division and they bring much grief to the council and the city staff. So why call him out now? Because he has the ear of Anthony Hicks. Mark Layton is one of his advisors, so to speak. I don't trust Mark Layton, and I don't trust Anthony Hicks. I don't pick fights. I don't go looking for that. But I don't run from them either. But this has got to be the way it is. We've got to recognize it. Fergus Falls has a great place to live, work, and raise a family. I've said that. I'll say it again. I'm qualified and motivated to share this message with all I come into contact with. I have good relationships with hundreds of area businesses, organizations, agencies, and I will bring a can-do attitude to the office of the mayor. I appreciate your support. Look me up on Facebook at Scott Kwame for mayor, and I believe I am obviously the best candidate for this position. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Anthony Hicks. Um, well, obviously I'm only half a man, so, um, but I think my half a man is bigger than that of Scott's. Um, I, uh, I, I voted to keep the open forum in place um, to, and to be televised and to be part of the council meeting and um, Scott did not. I do not follow the herd. Um, I have voted independently for the whole time that I've been on council and it wasn't until two years ago when Al Kramer and Laura Job joined the council that if you look back you'll see there's many times when the vote was seven to one, um, myself being that one. I've supported keeping the management of the airport locally. You know, Scott wants to move that to a company based out of Alex, which is where obviously he works. I work in Fergus. I employ multiple people that live in Fergus. You know, we have over a $5 million payroll, of which most of that goes to Fergus. You know, I operate a $100 million plus asset. You know, I understand what maintenance is. I understand what preventative maintenance is. And to have, understand how to keep an asset functioning. As a retired professional, I will work hard on your behalf and the residents in the city. I believe we have an opportunity for additional funding on multiple projects that we can get from the state. This morning I looked up on the League of Minnesota website and there was over 11 different opportunities for grants or subsidized loans. You know, that's, we don't go after those, um, you know, Scott says he's a salesman, you know, well, you know, we all can be salesmen. I, I sell every day. I have to keep the people above me happy and I have to keep the people below me happy. So, and for those of you that um, wish to meet me, I will be at the Riverfront Park um, on Thursday between four and six. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Let's give a round of applause to our candidates. <laughs> Feel free to stay and have a conversation with them. We invite you to join us on Thursday, September 26, at Lake Country Service Cooperative for our third Meet the Candidates, featuring all the candidates running for Ontario County Commissioners and the Minnesota House of Representatives, District 9A. On behalf of the Fergus Falls Chamber and Layton Media, 
Thank you for attending. You can catch a rebroadcast of all of our Meet the Candidates events on the Fergus Now app, 1258 KBRF. And have a good night. Remember to vote on or before Tuesday, November 5th. Thank you.